I want that understood that what I am to say today is not designed to be anti-government. It is designed to be pro-freedom and pro-people of the land, Americans. I must say that our law system was never designed to enslave the people. It was designed to guarantee the freedoms and the protections of the property of the people. George Washington said, government is not reason, it is not eloquence, it is force, like fire. It is a dangerous servant and a fearful master. Our legal system was designed to function according to the common law, the Magna Carta, the Articles of Confederation, the Northwest Ordinance. The Seventh Amendment of the United States Constitution says this, in suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. So you see, the law of America is the common law. What has happened historically is that statute law, merchant law, and the law of the seas has taken control of the American courts. And we will go into that discussion as we speak of the seduction of our legal system by the law of merchant in America through the United States Corporation, Washington, D.C., 10 miles square. The frustration that many feel about our judicial system can be overwhelming and frightening and cause fear based on a lack of understanding and knowledge. In fact, it has turned into governmental and legal tyranny where the people no longer can exercise their freedom or their power both over the government and the judicial servants. When defending ourselves from government, we find that the lawyers quickly take our money and then tell us as the ship is sinking, I can't help you with that, I am an officer of the court. In fact, attorneys are officers of the court, they are not lawyers of the land. The people are supposed to be the lawyers. Ultimately, the only way for us to survive is to understand the rules of the game, to come to an understanding of the true nature of the law. The court officers called attorneys have established and secured a virtual monopoly over this sphere of knowledge by implying that the subject is too difficult for the average American to understand and by creating a separate vocabulary mainly out of Latin and out of English words otherwise used in common knowledge is turned into an esoteric system which no one can understand except the strained officers of this esoteric legal manipulation of the freedom of the American people. Many have tried to deal with this situation in other wise than peaceful. We recommend the peaceful method to know and understand the law and where common law truly stands and its authority in the legal system. And we must know it, we must relearn it, we must reclaim it, and apply it anew in the courts that are and turn them back into common law courts. So as we deal with this, we must also consider the fact that these systems have come to tyrannize and to enslave us. Many have beat the IRS and they've used Supreme Court decisions to do so. Many are members of patriotic groups and study Supreme Court cases. In fact, many have stopped paying and filing income tax papers, and some have received, of course, the ruthless hand of the IRS corporation, a foreign corporation at that, to disturb their lives and try to extort money out from them, and even has put many in prison falsely. To that, we can only say that when some claim of deficiency is given to an American, by this corporation IRS, never argue the facts in a tax case. If you're not required to file 
You should not care whether they say you owe $60 or $6,000. If you're not required to file, the amount does not matter. Never argue the amount. This is a fact issue. Usually when you get this notice of deficiency, it is for some fantastic amount. The IRS Corporation wants you to run in and argue about the amount. The minute you say, I don't owe that money, you have agreed that you owe something and you conceded to their jurisdiction. Do not be shocked at the amount of any notice of deficiency, even if it's $10 million. If the law says you are not required to file or pay any income tax, the amount means absolutely nothing. By arguing the amount, they will just say that you must go to the tax court and decide what the amount is. When you walk into their tax court, the law issues are already decided. You are only to decide how much you owe. They will not listen to any arguments at law. So when you see an agent and you tell them that you're not a taxpayer and you do not need to file, they will understand. And if not, there is a quick way to solve it. Many say you are required to file. We ask them if it's voluntary. They say yes, and then they say you must volunteer, which is an absolute absurdity. Once all the research is done, they should be able to determine that you are not required to file. Your file will be closed, and the matter is done. Here are the words of one man who had experience with these types of battles and was even called to the side of a friend to assist him in the struggle. He said this, I thought, sure, I had the answer, but when a friend got charged with willful failure to file an income tax return, he asked me to help him. I told him that they have to prove that he willfully refused to file, and I suggested that he should put me on the witness stand. He should ask me if I spoke at a certain time and place in Scott's Bluff, and did I see him in the audience. He should then ask me what I spoke of that day. When I got on the stand, I brought out all the Supreme Court cases I had used to win my case. I thought I would be lucky to get a sentence or two out before the judge cut me off. Instead, I was reading whole paragraphs, and the judge didn't stop me. I read one and then another and so forth. Finally, when I had read about as much as I thought I should. The judge called the recess of the court. I told my friend I thought we had made it. There was not just no way they could rule against him after that testimony. The defense presented its case and decided to rest after my testimony. We showed that my friend was not required to file and that the Supreme Court had held this position. Then the prosecution presented its closing statement. We were sure we had won. But at the end, the judge spoke to the jury and told them, you will decide the facts of this case and I will give you the law. The law requires that a man must file an income tax form. You decide whether he filed it. What a shock. The jury convicted him. Later, some of the members said, what could we do? The man had admitted that he had not filed the form, so we had to convict him. When the trial was over, I went around to the judge's office and he was just coming in through the back door. I said, Judge, by what authority do you overturn the standing decisions of the United States Supreme Court? You sat on that bench while I read the case law. Now, how do you, a district judge, have authority to overturn the standing decision of the United States Supreme Court? He said, oh, those were all decisions. I said, those are standing decisions. They're called presidents. They have never been overturned. You have no right to overturn a standing decision of the United States Supreme Court in a district court. He said, name any decision of the Supreme Court after 1938 and I'll honor it. But all the decisions you read were prior to 1938. Prior to 1938, the Supreme Court was dealing with public law, which is common law. Since 1938, the Supreme Court has dealt with public policy, which is statute merchant law. The charge that Mr. S. was being tried for is a public policy statute, not public law, that is common law. And those Supreme Court cases do not apply to public policy. I asked him what happened in 1938. He said that he had already told me too much. And this is what our friend says. I began to investigate. I found that 1938 was the year of the Erie Railroad.
versus Tompkins case of the Supreme Court. It was also the year the courts claimed they blended law with equity. I read the Erie Railroad case. A man had sued the Erie Railroad for damages when he was struck by a board sticking out of a boxcar as he was walking along beside the tracks. The district court had decided on commercial or negotiable instruments law, that this man was not under any contract with the Erie Railroad and therefore he lacked standing to sue the company. Under the common law, natural law, he was damaged and he would have had the right to sue. This overturned a standing decision of over 100 years. Swift versus Tyson in 1840 was a similar case. And the decision of the Supreme Court then was that in a case of this type, the court would judge by the common law, that is natural law, of the state where the incident occurred, in this case, Pennsylvania. In the Erie Railroad case, the Supreme Court now ruled that all federal cases will be judged under the negotiable instruments law. There would be no more decisions based on the common law at the federal level. So here we find the blending of law with equity. So we see that all courts since 1938 were merchant law courts and not common law courts. This has led to the legal seduction of our court systems and our legal system. Our friend continues. Fortunately, I made a friend of a judge. He even said, you are an interesting man. If you're ever in town, stop by, and if I'm not sitting on a case, we will visit. Later, when I went to visit that judge, I told him of my problem with the Supreme Court cases dealing with public policy rather than public law. He said, in 1938, all the higher judges, the top attorneys, and the U.S. attorneys were called into a secret meeting. And this is what we were told. America is bankrupt. It is a bankrupt nation. It is owned completely by its creditors, mostly foreign corporations. The creditors own the Congress. They own the executive. They own the judiciary. And they own all the state governments. Take silent judicial notice of this fact, but never reveal it openly. Your court is operating under admiralty jurisdiction. Call it anything you want, but do not call it admiralty. The reason they cannot call it admiralty jurisdiction is that your defense would be different in admiralty jurisdiction from your defense under the common law. If admiralty there is no court that has jurisdiction unless there is a valid international contract in dispute. If you know it is admiralty jurisdiction and they have admitted on the record that you are in an admiralty court, you can demand that the international maritime contract to which you are supposedly a party and which you supposedly have breached be placed in evidence. No court has admiralty or maritime jurisdiction unless there is a valid international maritime contract that was breached. And if so, there must be evidence, or the evidence shows that you have been brought under the legal applications of a contract of which you unknowingly and unwillingly and unintentionally were brought into under the auspices of fraud. Please keep that in mind. It is vital to your understanding of how this system works. So if the court was ever to show this standing, you would be able to say, I never knew that I got involved with an international maritime contract. So I deny that such a contract exists. If this court is taking jurisdiction in admiralty, then place the contract in evidence so that I may challenge the validity of it. What they would have to do is to place the national debt into evidence. They would have to admit that the international bankers, foreign corporations, own the whole nation and that we are their slaves, which is truly another word for the common term used today, citizens. It was not convenient at that time in 1938 for foreign bankers to reveal that they own America under the auspices of admiralty law. The reason they would not tell anyone that they owned everything is that there were still too many Americans with guns.
so until they can gradually consolidate all armies into a world army and all courts into a single world court, it is not politic to admit the jurisdiction under which the courts are operating in America. When we understand this reality, we will realize that there are certain secrets they do not want to admit and that we can use to our benefit. Let us speak of jurisdiction. The Constitution of the United States mentions three jurisdictions in which the courts may operate, common law, equity law, and admiralty or maritime law. Let us look at common law. Common law is natural law. It is based on God's laws as originally presented by the Bible. Any time someone is charged under the common law, there must be a damaged party. You are free under the common law to do anything you please as long as you do not infringe on the life, the liberty, or property of someone else. You have a right to make a fool of yourself provided you do not infringe on the life, liberty, or property of another. The common law does not allow for any governmental action which prevents a man from making a fool of himself. For instance, when you cross the state lines, you will probably see a sign which says, buckle your seat belts, it is the law. This cannot be common law because who would you injure if you did not buckle up? No one. This would be compelled performance. But common law cannot compel performance. It does not do such a thing. Any violation of common law is a criminal act and is punishable. Equity is law which compels performance. It compels you to perform to the exact letter of any contract that you are a party to. So if you have compelled performance, there must be a contract somewhere, and you are being compelled to perform under the obligation of that contract. Now this can only be a civil action, not criminal. In equity jurisdiction, you cannot be tried criminally, but you can be compelled to perform to the letter of a contract. If you then refuse to perform as directed by the court, you can be charged with contempt of court, which is a criminal action. Are our seatbelt laws equity laws? No, they are not. But you cannot be penalized, imprisoned, or punished for not keeping to the letter of a contract. Now let us speak about admiralty or maritime law. This is a civil jurisdiction of compelled performance which also has criminal penalties for not adhering to the letter of a contract, but this only applies to international contracts. Now we can see what jurisdiction the seatbelt laws and all traffic laws, building codes, ordinances, tax codes, etc. are under. Whenever there is a penalty for failure to perform, such as willful failure to file, that is admiralty or maritime law, and there must be a valid international contract in force. That is why many times when you come to these court judges, these admiralty judges in courtrooms, all you truly have to say is, I do not plead in courts of contract. However, the courts don't want to admit that they are operating under admiralty or maritime jurisdiction. So they took international law or law merchant and adopted it into our codes. This is what you call infiltration. This is what the Supreme Court decided in the Erie Railroad case, that their decisions from then on will be based on commercial law or business law and that it will have criminal penalties associated with it which is completely contrary to common law. Since they were instructed not to call it admiralty jurisdiction, they now call it statutory jurisdiction, and their codes are called statutes. Now let us look at courts of contract. You may ask how we got into a situation where we can be charged with failure to wear seat belts and be fined for it. Isn't the judge sworn to uphold the Constitution? Of course he is, but you must understand that the Constitution in Article 1, Section 10, gives us the unlimited right to contract as long as we do not infringe on the life, liberty, or property of someone else. Contracts are enforceable, and the Constitution gives two jurisdictions 
where contracts can be enforced, equity and admiralty. But we find them being enforced in statutory jurisdiction. This is the embarrassing part for the courts, but we can use this to box in the judges into a corner in their own courts. Contracts must be voluntary. Under the common law and natural law, every contract must be entered into knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally by both parties, or it is void and unenforceable. These are the characteristics of a common law contract. It is voluntary, it is intentional, and it is knowingly by both parties. There is another characteristic. It must be based on substance. For example, contracts used to read, for one dollar and other valuable considerations, I will paint your house, etc. That was a valid contract. The dollar was a genuine silver dollar. Now suppose you wrote a contract that said, for one Federal Reserve note and other considerations, I will paint your house, etc. Suppose, for example, I painted your house the wrong color. Could you go into a common law court and get justice? No, you could not. You see, a Federal Reserve note is a colorable dollar as it has no substance. And in a common law jurisdiction, that contract would be unenforceable because the Federal Reserve note is not substance. According to Black's Law Dictionary, the fifth edition, the word colorable means that which is in appearance only and not in reality, what it purports to be, hence counterfeit, feigned, having the appearance of truth, unquote. Colorable money and colorable courts. The word colorable means something that appears to be genuine, but it's not. Maybe it looks like a dollar, and maybe it spins like a dollar, but if it is not redeemable for lawful money, silver and gold, it is colorable. If a Federal Reserve note is used in a contract, then the contract becomes a colorable contract, and colorable contracts must be enforced under a colorable jurisdiction. So by creating Federal Reserve notes, the government had to create jurisdictions to cover the kinds of contracts which use them. We now have what is called statutory jurisdiction, which is not a genuine admiralty jurisdiction. It is a colorable jurisdiction because we are using colorable money. Colorable admiralty is now known as statutory jurisdiction. How did we come under this statutory jurisdiction? The answer is in three letters, UCC, Uniform Commercial Code. The government set up a colorable law system to fit the colorable currency. It used to be called the law merchant or the law of redeemable instruments because it dealt with paper which was redeemable in something of substance. But once Federal Reserve notes came into existence and had become unredeemable, there had to be a system of law which was completely colorable from start to finish. This system of law was codified as the Uniform Commercial Code and has been adopted in every state by contract. This is colorable law and is used in all the color courts. Remember, the key to this entire situation is that the country is bankrupt and we have no rights. If the master says do this, then the slave has to do what the master requires. As slaves, we are compelled to perform. We have no rights. We are citizens. But the creditors or masters had to cover that up, so they created a system of law called the Uniform Commercial Code. This colorable jurisdiction under the Uniform Commercial Code is the key to understanding our present legal system and the situation we are in. Contract or agreement. One difference between common law and the Uniform Commercial Code is that in common law, contracts must be entered into, one, knowingly, two, voluntarily, and three, intentionally. Under the UCC, this is not so. First of all, written contracts are unnecessary. Under this new law, agreements can be binding, and if you only exercise the benefits of an agreement, it is presumed or implied that you intend to meet the obligations associated with those benefits. If you accept the benefit offered by government, then you are obligated to follow to the letter each and every statute involved with that benefit. 
The method has been to get everyone exercising a benefit, and they don't even have to tell the people what the benefit is. Some people think it is the driver's license, the marriage license, or the birth certificate, and so forth. It is none of these. The compelled benefit. I believe the benefit being used is that we have been given the privilege of discharging debt with limited liability instead of actually paying off debt in total with substance. When we pay a debt, we give substance for substance. If I buy a quart of milk with the silver dollar, that dollar bought the milk and the milk bought the dollar. Substance for substance. But if I use Federal Reserve notes to buy milk, I have not paid for it. I still owe for the milk. I have incurred debt. There is no substance in Federal Reserve notes. It is worthless paper because it cannot be reasonably be used for anything else. Given in exchange for something of substantive value, we have been given a way to escape this endless accrual of debt, albeit with plenty of strings attached to them. Congress offers us this escape in the form of a benefit. Debt money created by the federal United States can be spent all over the continental United States, can be used to legal tender all debts, public and private. And the limited liability is that you cannot be sued for not paying your debts when you pay a debt using this colorable money. So now we have said, we're going to help you out, and you can just discharge your debts instead of paying your debts. When we use this colorable money to discharge our debts, we cannot use a common law court. We can only use a colorable court. We are completely under the jurisdiction of the Uniform Commercial Code. We are using non-redeemable negotiable instruments, and we are discharging debt rather than paying debts. Let us look now at remedy and recourse. Every system of civilized law must have two characteristics, remedy and recourse. Remedy is a way to get out from under the law. The recourse provides that if you have been damaged under the law, you can recover your loss. The common law, the law of merchants, and even the Uniform Commercial Code all have remedy and recourse. But for a long time, it could not be found. If you go to a law library and ask to see the Uniform Commercial Code, they will show you a shelf that is overwhelmingly filled with commercial code books. When you pick up one volume and start to read it, it will seem to have been intentionally written to be confusing. It takes a long time to discover where this remedy and recourse is found in the Uniform Commercial Code, the UCC. It is found right in the first volume at section 1-207 and 1-103. It has changed now to UCC 1-308. The remedy. Here is what the Uniform Commercial Code says in Title 1-207.7. The making of a valid reservation of rights preserves whatever rights the person then possesses and prevents the loss of such rights by application of concepts of waiver or estoppel. Unquote. It is important to remember when we go into a court that we are in a commercial international jurisdiction. If we go into court and say, I demand my constitutional rights, the judge will most likely say, you mention the Constitution again, and I will find you in contempt of court. That we don't understand how he can do that. Hasn't he sworn to uphold the Constitution? The rule is this. You cannot be charged under one jurisdiction and defend yourself under another jurisdiction. If the French government came to you and asked where you filed your French income tax of a certain year, do you go to the French government and say, I demand my constitutional rights? Of course not. The proper answer is, the law does not apply to me. I am not a Frenchman. You must make your reservation of rights under the jurisdiction in which you are charged, not under some other jurisdiction. So in a UCC court, 
You must claim your reservation of rights under UCC 1-207. UCC 1-207 says this, point nine. When a waivable right or claim is involved, the failure to make a reservation thereof causes a loss of the right and bars its assertion at a later date. You have to make your claim known early. The UCC further says in point four, the sufficiency of the reservation, any expression indicating an intention to reserve rights is sufficient, such as without prejudice. Remember those terms, without prejudice. It is how to legally reserve all your rights. That same claim and statement has been moved to UCC 1-308. You may say without prejudice, or when you are forced to take such a position, then you do it under duress and say under protest, or you may put all rights reserved, or with reservation of all rights, or explicitly reserving all rights. Whenever you signed any legal paper that deals with Federal Reserve notes, Right under your signature, without prejudice, UCC 1-207.4. This reserves your rights. You can show at UCC 1-207.4 or 1-308 that you have sufficiently reserved your rights. It is very important to understand just what that means. One man who used this in regard to a traffic ticket was asked by the judge just what he meant by writing without prejudice UCC 1-207 on his statement to the court. He had not tried to understand the concept. He only wanted to use it to get out of paying a citation. Did not know what it meant. When the judge asked him what he meant by signing it that way, he said that he was not prejudiced against anyone. And the judge knew that the man had no idea what he meant and he lost the case. You must know what it means. Without prejudice, UCC 1-207. When you use without prejudice, UCC 1-207, in connection with your signature, you are stating, I reserve my right not to be compelled to perform under any contract or commercial agreement that I did not enter into knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally. I do not accept the liability of the compelled benefit of any unrevealed contract or commercial agreement. It is refusing to take part, being unconscious, not taking the responsibility, a non assumpted The code is now moved to 1-308. What is the compelled performance of an unrevealed commercial agreement? When you use Federal Reserve notes instead of silver dollars, is it voluntarily? No. There is no lawful money or alternative, so you have to use Federal Reserve notes. You have to accept the benefit. The government has given you the benefit to discharge your debts with limited liability, and you don't have to pay your debts. But if you did not reserve your right under 1-207.7, 1-308, you are compelled to accept the benefit and are therefore obliged to obey every statute ordinance, and regulation of the government at all levels of government, federal, state, and local. If you understand this, you will be able to explain it to the judge when he asks, and he will ask, so be prepared to explain it to the court. You will also need to understand UCC 1-103, the argument and recourse. If you want to understand this fully, go to a law library and photocopy these two sections from the UCC, it is important to get the Anderson, third edition. The Anderson, third edition. Some of the law libraries will only have the West publishing version, and it is very difficult to understand. In Anderson, it is broken down with decimals into ten parts. And most importantly, it is written in plain English. Recourse. The recourse appears in the Uniform Commercial Code at 1-103.6, and please remember this part of the commercial code, 1-103.6. This is what it says. The code is complementary to the common law, which remains in force, 
except where displaced by the code. A statute should be construed in harmony with the common law unless there is a clear legislative intent to abrogate the common law, unquote. Now that is not possible because it is in the United States Constitution to uphold and judge by the common law, Article 7. It is permanent. This is the argument we use in court. The code recognizes the common law. If it did not recognize the common law, the government would have to admit that the United States is bankrupt and it is completely owned by its creditors and the government would have to go contrary to the Constitution itself. But it is not expedient to admit this, so the code was written so as not to abolish the common law. Therefore, if you have made a sufficient, timely, and explicit reservation of your rights under UCC 1-207, 1-308, 1-103.6, you may then insist that the statutes be construed in harmony with the common law. If the charge is a traffic citation, you may demand that the court produce the injured person who has filed a verified complaint. If, for example, you were charged with failure to buckle your belt, you may ask the court who was injured as a result of your failure to buckle up. However, if the judge won't listen to you and just moves ahead with the case, then you will want to read to him the last sentence of the Uniform Commercial Code 1-103.6. Actually, it is better to use a rubber stamp because this demonstrates that you had previously reserved your rights. The simple fact that it takes several days or a week to order and get a stamp shows that you had reserved your rights before signing any document. Anderson Uniform Commercial Code Lawyers Cooperative Publishing Company has a good copy. The code cannot be read to preclude a common law section. Tell the judge, Your Honor, I can sue you under the common law for violating my rights under the Uniform Commercial Code. I have a remedy under the UCC to reserve my rights under the common law. I have reserved the remedy, and now you must construe this statute in harmony with the common law. To be in harmony with the common law, you must come forth with the damaged party. If the judge insists on proceeding with the case, just act confused and ask this question. Let me see if I understand, Your Honor. Has this court made a legal determination that sections 1-207 and 1-308 and 1-103 of the Uniform Commercial Code, which is the system of law you are operating under, are not valid law before this court? Now the judge will understand his position. How can the court throw out one part of the code and uphold another? If he answers yes, then you say, I put this court on notice that I am appealing your legal determination. Of course, the higher court will uphold the code on appeal, and the judge will lose. The judge knows this, so once again, you have him boxed in. Just so we understand how the whole process works, let us look at a court situation such as a traffic violation. Assume you ran through a yellow line and a policeman gave you a Citation. The first thing you want to do is to delay the action at least three weeks. This you can do by being pleasant and cooperative with the officer. Explain to him that you are very busy and ask if he could please set your appearance for about three weeks later. At this point, we need to remember the government's trick. I'm not from the government. I'm here to help you. Now, we want to use this same approach with them. The next step is to go to the clerk of the traffic court and say, I believe it would be helpful if I talk to you because I want to save the government money. This will help get their attention. I am undoubtedly going to appeal this case. As you know, in an appeal, I have to have a transcript. But the traffic court does not have a court reporter. It would be a waste of taxpayers' money to do so. And it would have to give me a trial de novo in the, into a court of record. I do not need a transcript for appealing, and to save the government money, maybe you could schedule me to appear in a court of record instead. When you get into court, the judge will read the charges, driving through a yellow light, for instance, and this is a violation of ordinance so and so and so, he will ask, do you understand the charge against this? 
Well, you can really dismiss it by simply saying, I do not appeal in a court of contract. But if you wish to proceed, you can say, well, Your Honor, there is a question I would like to ask before I make a plea of anything. I think it could be answered if I could put the officer on the stand for a moment and ask him a few short questions. And the judge will probably say, I do not see why not. Let's swear the officer in and have him take the stand. Is this the instruments you gave me, you will ask the officer as you hand him the citation. And he'll say, yes, this is a copy of it. The judge has the other portion. Where did you get my address that you wrote on this citation? And he will answer, well, I got it from your driver's license. And then, of course, it's very important to get into record clearly stating that you do not understand the charges. With that in the record, the court cannot move forward to judge the facts. This will be covered later. Hand the officer your driver's license and say, is this the document you copied my name and address from? And he will answer, yes, this is where I got it. And then you'll ask, while you've got that in your hand, would you read the signature that's on that license? And you'll read the signature. While you're there, would you read into the record what it says under the signature? And the officer will read, without prejudice, UCC 1-207. The judge will immediately say, let me see that license. He look at it and turn to the officer and say, you did not notice this printing under the signature of the license when you copied the name and address on the citation? The officer will say, I did not. I was looking at the address, not down there. The judge will say, you're not a very observant officer. Therefore, I'm afraid I cannot accept your testimony in regard to the facts of this case. The case is dismissed. So the judge found a convenient way out. He could say that the officer was not observant enough to be a reliable witness. He did not want to admit the real nature of the jurisdiction of his court. Once it was in the record that you had written without prejudice, UCC 1-207, 1-308, on your license, the judge knew that he would have to admit that, first, you have reserved your common law rights under UCC. Secondly, you have done it sufficiently by writing without prejudice UCC 1-207, 1-308 on your license. And three, the statute would have to be read in harmony with the common law, and the common law says that the statute exists but there is no injured party. And fourthly, since there is no injured party or complaining witness, the court has no jurisdiction under the common law. If the judge tries to move ahead and tries the facts of the case, then you will want to ask him the following questions. Your Honor, let me understand this correctly. Has this court made a legal determination that it has authority under this jurisdiction that it is operating under to ignore two sections of the Uniform Commercial Code which have been called to its attention? If he says yes, tell him that you will put the court on notice that you will appeal that legal determination and that if you are damaged by his actions, you will sue him in a common law action under the jurisdiction of the UCC. This will work just as well with the IRS or any government entity. In fact, you can use the UCC with the IRS before you get to court using the code with the IRS. If the IRS sends you a notice of deficiency, this is called a presentment in the Uniform Commercial Code, a presentment in the UCC is very similar to the common law. First, we must understand just how this works in the common law. Suppose I get a man's name from a phone book, someone I had never met, and I send him a bill or invoice on a nice letterhead that says, for services rendered, $10,000. I send this by certified mail at the address taken from the telephone book. The man has to sign for it before he can open it, so I get a receipt that he received it. When he opens it, he finds a bill for $10,000 and the following statement. If you have any questions concerning this bill or the services rendered, you have 30 days to make your questions or objections known. Of course, he has never heard of me, so just throws the bill away and assumes that I'm confused or crazy. At the end of the 30 days, I go to the court and get a default judgment against him. He received a bill for $10,000 and was given 30 days to respond. 
He failed to object to it or ask any questions about the bill. Now he has defaulted on the bill, and I lawfully collect $10,000. That's common law. The UCC works on the same principle. The minute you get a notice of deficiency from the IRS, you must return it immediately with a letter that states what is to follow or something similar. Your letter will state, the presentment above is dishonored. Then you will put your name, has reserved all of his rights under the Uniform Commercial Code at UCC 1-207-1-308. This action will be all that is necessary as there is nothing more that they can do. In fact, someone helped another person in Arizona who received such a notice, and the man sent this letter dishonoring the presentment. The IRS wrote back that they could not make a determination at that office, but were turning it in to the collections department. A letter was attached from the collections department that said they were sorry for the inconvenience they had caused him and that the notice of deficiency had been withdrawn. So you see that if it is handled properly, these matters are easily resolved. No interest contract. If I were to insure a house that did not belong to me, that would be a no interest contract. I would just want the house to burn down. I would pay a small premium, perhaps a few hundred dollars, and insure it for $80,000 against fire. Then I would be waiting for it to burn so I could collect my small premium of $80,000 against the fire. Under the common law, and under the international law merchant, that is called a no-interest contract, and it is void and unenforceable in court. Unconscionable contracts. The Uniform Commercial Code no-interest contracts are called unconscionable contracts. The section on unconscionable contract covers more than 40 pages in the Anderson Code. The federal United States has made the states an accommodation party to the federal debt. I believe we could prove this to be an unconscionable contract. We should get some litigation to the courts before the government declares a national emergency, claiming that this state has no lawful responsibility for the national debt because it is an accommodation party to this debt through an unconscionable contract. If we have this litigation before the courts under international law, when the nation is declared bankrupt, the creditors would have to settle this matter first. They would want the new government to appear to be legitimate so that they could not just move in and take over the state as the case would be heard in an international court. Here's a question. How does one compel a judge? If you are arrested and going to court, just remember that in a criminal action, you have to understand the law or it is a reversible error for the court to try you. If you do not understand the law, they cannot try you. The fifth volume of the UCC, Y3-415, under Accommodation Party. One who signs commercial paper in any capacity for purpose lending his name to any other party to instrument. Such a party is surety. Surety is one who understands to pay money or do other act in the event that the principal fails therein. In any traffic or tax case, you are called into court and the judge reads the law and then asks, do you understand the charges? You would say, no, Your Honor, I do not. The judge would say, well, what's so difficult about that charge? Either you drove the wrong way on a one-way street or you did not. You can only go one way on that street, and if you go the other way, it's $50 fine. What's so difficult about that that you do not understand? Answer, well, Your Honor, it's not the letter of the law, but rather the nature of the law that I do not understand. The Sixth Amendment of the Constitution gives me the right to request the court to explain the nature of any action against me, and upon my request, the court has the duty to answer. I have a question about the nature of this action. Judge, well, what is it? What do you want to know? Always ask some easy questions first, as this establishes the fact that they are answering you. Well, Your Honor, is this a civil or criminal action? If it were a civil action, there would be no fine, so it has to be criminal. Then... Thank you, Your Honor, for telling me that. Then the record will show that this action against whoever is a criminal action. Is that right? Judge, yes. I would like to ask another question about this criminal action. There are two criminal jurisdictions mentioned in the Constitution. One is under the common law, and the other deals with international maritime contracts under the admiralty jurisdiction. Equity is civil, and you said this is a criminal action. 
So it seems it would have to be under either common or maritime law. But what puzzles me, Your Honor, is that there is no corpus delecti here that gives the court a jurisdiction over my person and property under the common law. Therefore, it does not appear to me that this is a court moving under the common law. Judge, no, I can assure you this court is not moving under the common law. Well, thank you, Your Honor, but now you make the charge against me even more difficult to understand. The only other criminal jurisdiction that would apply here would be that of international maritime contract if there was an international maritime contract involved. I would have to be a party to it, and it would have to be breached. The court would have to be operating in admiralty jurisdiction. I do not believe I have ever been under an international maritime contract, so I would deny that one exists. I would have to demand that such a contract, if it does exist, be placed in evidence so that I would have the chance to contest it. But surely this court is not operating under an admiralty jurisdiction. And here you put the words into the judge's mouth. The judge. No, I can assure you we're not operating under an admiralty jurisdiction. We're not out in the ocean somewhere. We're right here in the middle of the state. No, this is not an admiralty jurisdiction. Thank you, Your Honor. But now I am more puzzled than ever. If this charge is not under the common law, or under admiralty, and those are the only two criminal jurisdictions mentioned in the Constitution, what kind of jurisdiction could this court be operating under? The judge, it's statutory jurisdiction. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. I'm glad you told me that, but I have never heard of that jurisdiction. So if I have to defend under that jurisdiction, I would need to have the rules of criminal procedure for statutory jurisdiction. Can you tell me where I might find those rules? There are no rules for statutory jurisdiction, so the judge will get very angry at this point and say, if you want the answers to questions like that, you get yourself a licensed attorney. I'm not allowed to practice law from the bench. Then you answer, oh, Your Honor, I don't think anyone would accuse you of practicing law from the bench if you just answered a few questions to explain to me the nature of this action so that I might defend myself. The judge, I told you before I am not going to answer any more questions. Do you understand that? If you ask any more questions in regard to this, I'm going to find you in contempt of court. Now, if you can't afford a licensed attorney, the court will provide you with one. But if you want those questions answered, you must get answers from a licensed attorney. Then you will say, thank you, Your Honor, but let me just see if I got this straight. This court has made the legal determination that it has authority to conduct a criminal action against me, the accused, under a secret jurisdiction, the rules of which are known only to this court and licensed attorneys, thereby denying me the right to defend in my own person. He has no answer for that. The judge will probably postpone the case and eventually just let it go. But remember one rule, you never go into court with a chip on your shoulder. Be educated, be decent, and they can't try you criminally if you do not understand the charge. That would automatically be a reversible error on appeal. The court reporter. In many courts, there will be a regular court reporter. He gets his job on the judge's pleasure, so he doesn't want to displease the judge. The court reporter is sworn to give an accurate transcript of every word that is spoken in the courtroom. But if the judge makes a slip of the tongue, he turns to his court reporter and says, I think you had better leave that out of the transcript. Just say it got a little too far ahead of you and you couldn't quite get everything in. So this statement will be missing from the transcript. In one case, we brought a licensed reporter with us, and the judge got very angry and said, this court has a licensed court reporter right here, and the record of this court is this court reporter's record. No other court reporter's record means anything in this court. We responded with, of course, Your Honor, we're certainly glad to use your regular court reporter, but you know, Your Honor, sometimes things move so fast that a court reporter gets a little behind and so doesn't quite keep it all. Wouldn't it be nice if we had another licensed court reporter in the courtroom just in case your reporter got a little behind so that we could fill in from this other court reporter's data? I'm sure, Your Honor, that you want an accurate transcript. I like using this because it gives a bad dog a good name. The judge went along, and from that moment on, he was very careful about what he said. 
These are little tricks to getting around the court. The UCC 1-207 review or UCC 1-308. It is so important to know and understand the meaning of without prejudice UCC 1-207 or UCC 1-308. It is very important that you understand what without prejudice means. The use of without prejudice in connection with any signature indicates that I have received my common law right not to be compelled to perform under any contract that I did not enter into knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally. And furthermore, I do not accept the liability associated with the compelled benefit of any unrevealed contract or commercial agreement. Once you state that, it is all the judge needs to hear. Under the common law, contract must be entered into knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally by both parties, or it is declared void and unenforceable. You are claiming the right not to be compelled to perform under any contract that you did not enter into knowingly, voluntarily, and intentionally, and you do not accept the liability associated with the compelled benefit of any unrevealed contract or agreement. The compelled benefit is the privilege to use Federal Reserve notes to discharge your debts with limited liability rather than to pay your debts with silver coins. It is a compelled benefit because there is no silver available for circulation. You have to eat and you have to work, so you are compelled to use these notes. This is the compelled benefit rendered by government so that you will be obligated under an implied agreement to obey every statute, ordinance, and regulation passed by governments at all levels, federal, state, and local. Learning to defend oneself that is being responsible instead of turning over one more part of our lives to professionals may be the only way to have any chance of digging ourselves out of this pit of legal tyranny. Perhaps the greatest problem we face in education today is a matter of widespread legal illiteracy and ignorance. Naturally, there will always be numbers of people who just don't care about these issues, who either have a soft life which is supported and maintained by the secret system of law and the institutions which have grown up around it, or they don't believe that anything can be done about it, they simply don't have the energy or inclination to do anything about it, See UCC 1-201, General Definition 3 says, Agreement means the bargain of the parties in fact as found in their language by implication from other circumstances, including course of dealing or trade or usage of trade or course of performance. I'll read it one more time. Uniform Commercial Code 1-201, General Definitions Number 3. Agreement means the bargain of the parties, in fact, as found in their language or by implication from other circumstances, including course of dealing or trade or usage of trade or course of performance, unquote. This is the UCC connection and the UCC trickery, but at the same time, as we have seen, it does provide for remedy and recourse. Our responsibility is to know where we stand and how to apply the law.